Hello everyone this is part 26 of what if Naruto was adopted by Kakashi, and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, and check out the playlist, to see more comment down below, now let's start the, intro. Naruto was pretty happy with his win as he got back to the others. Granted pulling off that summon had been tough, he still wasn't calling up the type of toad he needed all the time, but this time the gamble paid off. Plus that new wind jutsu that Jiraiya taught him really worked out well. He was feeling really good about himself and if this didn't show the kinds of skills to impress those Hyuga elders that he knew were watching, well what else did he have to do to impress them? Naruto knew that in this exam not only would he be judged for being a chunin but also by the elders of Hanata's clan. But then again, Naruto never once backed away from a challenge, he would do it like with any other challenge. Rush forward without a care and win through sheer will and guts. Hey nice job out there, Kiba said to him and for Kiba it was very satisfying seeing that Miss Ninja get defeated. He still could feel the metal of that sword cutting into him from before. It had been the worst injury that he had ever gotten and in fact scared him a bit. But he had been training himself to get stronger after that defeat as well. He had seen the power he could come up against, and he swore never again to get defeated like that. Naruto chuckled as he scratched the back of his head, it was nothing, I just kicked his asses all. Well at any rate that was a very good performance out of you and Sakura, Kakashi said as he stepped towards his son. You both should be proud. Thanks, both Genins said at once hearing this. I just hope I can go on, I think is used up a lot of strength for that match, Sakura sighed as she went to her pocket. She could feel the small medical supplies that most carried only she had a few extra things. That training with Hanata, she had learned a few things from the other girl. Healing ointments were very nice to have as she pulled one out and tossed it to Naruto. Here, Hanata helped me make it and you look like you could use a few. Naruto looked at the small thing and he did apply it, if only for show. He knew that the fox would heal any damage soon but it was best to make it seem like the ointment had worked. He gave it back with thanks as he noticed that Ino was nearly kicking Shikamaru down the stairs to get him to his match. It was kind of funny to watch the two of them, as Ino nagged him about getting down there and that he better win. Man, you'd think they were married or something, Naruto muttered. I wouldn't know about that, Choji said as he munched on a bag of chips. All excitement was making him hungry after all. He says that he wouldn't want another woman nagging him all the time. Those that knew of his mother could see what the boy was getting at, then again he was a mirror image of his father, who had married such a woman. It was a bit of a joke that the Nara males were secretly submissive masochists. At least that's what you'd say behind their backs, lazy as some of the males were, you still didn't want to piss them off. What do you think? Shino asked Neji who were both watching as the fight between Temari and Shikamaru started off. Both boys had personal reasons for fighting in this match. Shino however had lost his chance as Naruto took had taken revenge for Kiba's injuries, he didn't mind that though. That ending was better than anything Shino could have come up with anyway. But Neji was still hoping for a fight with Temari after how she had humiliated and hurt Tenten. Neji was carefully watching the fight, he could tell that both fighters seemed to be the type to plan things out. They were both strategists, something that surprised him about Skikamaru when he saw it in the last part of the exam. But while Shikamaru was laid back and let his opponents do all the work, Temari was the total opposite. She preferred to take the initiative and that's where this fight was going. She was pushing him back all the time with her wind as she had the range on him. Already he had tried his shadow technique but she knew that what his range was. She had drawn a line in the dirt letting her know how far to keep back. It doesn't look good for him, Neji commented. Yes, but looks are often misleading, Shino said cryptically. Neji was about to ask what he meant when he saw it, the Nara's shadow had reached beyond the line that Temari had drawn. At first Neji thought that Shikamaru had been holding back but he did it again. It was then that Temari, Neji and Shino all saw that the shadows were being strengthened by the sun going down. Shikamaru was playing for time, if the sun went down far enough then his shadow would reach her no matter what she did. Impressive, but can he keep it up? Neji asked. That remains to be seen. Shino said as they watched on. Temari knew that she was going to have to get this annoying guy down before his plan could be finished. 
The younger boy was keeping himself hidden from her wind attacks, she couldn't get in closer and the farther away the less power her wind attacks had. It was very annoying for her, especially since she still had the invasion up next. She couldn't waste too much on this boy but she also refused to lose to him either. It was then that he came out as he threw something up into the sky. It was a makeshift parachute with a kunai in his shirt. She didn't understand but she went for the attack anyway. She saw him using his shadow again but smirked as her arms were already swung back for her own attack. Only to freeze a seesaw two shadows, a circular one of the object he threw up into the sky. Then his shadow touched it and it suddenly had new life as he came further than she had ever seen it. She mentally cursed, she didn't know that another shadow would actually, feed, the shadow's power. She jumped out of the way knowing what would happen when that thing touched her. It chased her on the ground as she focused on just keeping away from it, just for a bit to be able to get out of its reach. As soon as she did she could counter and take him out as he was fully exposed now. When he stopped she smirked, now it was her time. She pulled back and then was just about to use her fan when her body froze. She couldn't move, she looked down in shock but the small shadow line hadn't touched her. What's going on? Temari demanded. Every can cast a shadow, even if it is just a little bit. Even things like a grove in the earth can cast a shadow if the sun hits it the right way. He told her in a bored tone. Temari looked to her right and her eyes widened. There next to her was a long grove cut into earth by one of the previous battles. When Sakara's aqua tower had been used it had cut a line into the ground. With the sun as it was now the slight depression in the ground cast a small shadow along the edge. She looked to see a thin trail of shadow coming out of the groove and attached to her foot. She followed it and although its path, she had to squint but she could see a second trail by his feet going into the groove. Temari gritted her teeth as she wondered what this boy would do to her. She remembered the sound girl, this boy could make her do anything now. Well get it over with, Temari told him preparing herself for the worse. Hey, no real point now, he said lazily. I'm nearly out of chakra so I think I'll call it quits. Hey Proctor I quit okay. Genma blinked a few times, are you sure kid? Yeah, besides who cares about being a Chunin and fighting a girl is just too troublesome, he said. When the announcement was made that Temari was the winner it was shocking to the audience to say the least. Well there was at least one vocal outburst from the crowd. Shikamaru you idiot. Ino yelled down at him. Why the hell would you give up? If you think I was hard on you before then you don't know anything. When this is all over I'm going to make sure you're not going to be such a lazy bum anymore. Ino went on and on and for a moment Shikamaru was wondering if he made the right choice or not as the blonde kept on nagging him. Shino versus Neji. With the last battle over it was time for Neji and Shino to take the field. They stood across from each other. There was no malice between them like in any of the previous fights, they had both made up their minds to do the best out of respect for the other. Neji got into the gentle fist stance as he activated his Byakugan. Shino stood his ground as he lifted his sleeves, a large amount of black bugs swarmed out towards that Hyuga prodigy. Neji knew enough about Shino's clan to have an idea of what he could expect to happen. With his eyes activated he could follow the insects as they swarmed around him. With speed that made his limbs seem like a blur of motion to most watching, he sent his hands out attacking each and every bug. The gentle fist style, was something that all Hyuga trained in. There were moves that were meant to strike over a hundred times in a manner of seconds. So attacking at the speeds to defend himself from Shino's horde of chakra-eating insects was no problem. The Abarain boy would not be deterred by this as he only intensified his attacks. Keeping to the long range that was his speciality it was his hope to simply keep the other boy at bay and slowly chip away at him. But this was proving more difficult than he had first thought. The problem was that Neji wasn't letting any of his insects latch on. Shino had never faced an opponent that could defend against his attacks like this. Most would just avoid the insects, but Neji stood his ground, never giving an inch as he kept a perfect defense. Well, Shino was about to test just how effective the Hyuga prodigy had. Up in the stands, Hanata with her father and sister were watching the fight with interests. Hanata watched in amazement at how Neji was able to keep Shino's bugs from attacking him. Being on the same team as Shino, she knew how hard that was from sparring. She knew that she didn't have the skill her cousin was displaying. She was proud of her decision early to forfeit her match to him. Looking at him now, she knew she had made the right choice. 
he deserved to go this far and she hoped that one day she could match Neji in skill. Father, he seems to be doing very well. Hanabi commented watching the fight. Shouldn't uncle be here to see this? He's here, he told his youngest as he looked to see where his twin brother was. Given the nature of the Chunin exam security was always important. Several of the Huga clan were used to look for traps, hidden weapons and other such things in the crowd of people when they entered. He looked up across the field to see his twin by the stair entrance watching his son. He couldn't see the expression on his younger sibling but he knew it had to be prideful and with good reason. Neji was the strongest of his generation in their clan, even among the rest of the village. Then something happened, Shino had started to use a very large amount of bugs to swarm around the Huga prodigy. Neji had nowhere to move now as the swarm started to envelope him. He sighed watching this, no matter how good he was at the gentle fist, there was just no way to defend against that. At least that was until Neji not only surprised him but everyone else there. A blue sphere came into play as Neji seemed to rotate on the ground. Kaiten, he muttered in surprise at the technique. It was an advanced move that normally only the main house could master. It was the fact that a branch family member could use that, and at such a young age, was just unheard of. It seems that Neji is more promising than any thought. I think I saw you use that in training, what is it? Hanabi asked her father. Something that I think even your uncle didn't expect. He told her. That was true, on the other side of the stadium where he was stationed for security, his as she watched as his son used a move that only adults could perform. No matter what the outcome of this match he was already proud at what his son had accomplished. Although he was wondering how he had trained himself to do that. Neji certainly didn't ask for help. Well it would be something to ask him later when this was all over with. Tenton smiled as she watched Neji perform the move, she had been training with him for the whole month to get to this point. She felt glad that she was able to be of use to Neji getting stronger. He had even thanked her saying that he couldn't have done this without her. She felt her cheeks flush a bit remembering his words. Truth was, spending a full month with him just the two of them had been very nice. Back on the field, Neji was still fighting Shino. Although he had been hoping to hold that move back until later, it was his only trump card but Shino had forced his hand. That said a lot about the mysterious shades wearing boy. Well he would have had to use that at any rate, he looked around his feet. There was a wide circle that was perfectly made into the earth and many of Shino's bugs lay on the ground unmoving. Shino had never seen or heard of anything like this before, he never knew that the Huga clan could do something like that. It was very impressive and very effective. He took stock of the battle so far. Close combat with a Huga was suicide so that was out. Mid to long range was where he excelled at but with that ultimate defense Shino couldn't see a way past it. Plus he had lost too much of his colony in this battle. If he went on like this he would kill off his entire colony and to his clan that was unacceptable. To his clan, the insects were as much a part of them as an organ. They lived in symbiosis, giving them a home and food while they gave the clan power. But that also meant a great responsibility towards their safety. Some risks were just unacceptable. Shino thought it out as he raised his arm and looked to the proctor. I submit this battle. You sure kid? Genma asked. Shino nodded and Genma was forced to call the match over. Shino knew that as he was now, he couldn't beat the other boy. He didn't have anything that could get past that defense and he would only lose his colony and chakra in the process. It was the only logical thing to do, to pull back from a losing fight. There was no dishonor in this and he felt that it was the right choice at the moment. The Hockage looked on pleased by how things were going, so far the Leaf Genins were both proofing themselves in both skill and honor. It was nice to see the younger generation doing so well. I hope that you don't mind your daughter winning like that, the third said to the Kazakage next to him. Not at all, although that isn't the kind of victory that one can be proud of, was the response he got from the masked man sitting next to him. Yes well the Nara boy obviously thought things through. There is no shame in admitting your limits, in fact not knowing them could lead to much worse than losing a simple fight. The third commented as he saw Shino also seemed to know this lesson well. I suppose but those that aren't strong enough to win, aren't suitable for the battlefield as they will only die anyway. The third paused as he felt a sense of familiarity with this conversation. It was not unlike the kinds of talks he used to have with people like Danzo or his own student Orokimaru. He knew that the Kazekage was a bit of a cold and distant man. But had he recently decided on that line of thought as well? 
it was a bit depressing thought that someone like a cage would go with that line of thinking. That had been the reason why he had passed his student over for the position of Hockage to Jirei's apprentice Minato. Then again given what was about to happen today, maybe he shouldn't be totally surprised by the Kazekage's new attitude. The Hockage thought back to all the work he had done yesterday to prepare for the coming storm. Flashback to yesterday. The Hockage was in his office as he had finished writing the last of the orders to be sent. The final exam would soon take place and he needed to prepare. He had a few different piles of orders, each one for a select group. The first pile was to his Anbu forces, the next would be for the Jonans and Special Jonans, the one after that for a few of the Tunans that he felt would be trusted with a few special missions. Lastly was a pile for the Jonan senseis. There wasn't much time left, but the planning had been in the works for some time. Are you sure we have everything set up, Hokage Sama? Asked a man in a cloak with the hood pulled up so you couldn't see the face within it. We've been planning for a while now, but you can't plan for everything. This is the best we can do and hope that to any changes that occur we can handle. The man nodded with a sign, I just hope she doesn't kill me when this is all over. She's a professional she knows what kind of sacrifices we have to make as a ninja. The Hockage told him. The man seemed to wince at a thought, yeah but she's going to be pissed. Plus I didn't like being locked away all this time either. The man coughed into his hand. It was damn cold at night and I think I caught a cold in the underground areas that Ibiki uses for torture. It was one of the few places where no one would find you. The Hockage got up and handed him a scroll. Your orders are here, I'm having my Anbu deliver the rest. What of the traitor? The man asked before he made to leave the office. He's been watched by our best and also been fed as much false information that I believe he will take without becoming suspicious. Present. Now the Hockage looked down at the arena full of people, many didn't know what was about to take place. In fact even he wasn't sure what was going to happen, he had only to guess what was going to happen today and plan around that. But at any rate the operation would have already started, first with the Anbu teams making sweeps through the village, and the Tunans would be already started with their work. The children and civilians were top priority of course. The old man just hoped that they could lessen the coming bloodshed. Lee versus Dosu. Now it is my turn. Lee shouted out as he couldn't wait for his time to fight. That's right Lee, show them your flames of youth. Guy yelled out to his protege. Yes Guy Sensei. Lee shouted out as he literally jumped off the railing into the arena to the surprise of everyone. That idiot, he might break his legs if he's not careful, Tenton shouted out as she raced to the edge to look to see Lee running out towards the field. She was a little dumbfounded as she had expected his legs to break under the strain of that fall. After all, with all those weights he puts on, she had expected he should have buried himself into the ground from a fall like that if he wasn't careful. She looked at her sensei with a questioning look. I had him take the weights off for the day, he won't need them with all the battles ahead, Guy told her. You could have warned me, she said dryly. For what reason? Guy asked her perplexed. She just muttered something about wishing she could switch teams for a time. She felt that she could use a vacation from her sensei and overactive teammate. Tenton felt a presence coming up at that point. She looked to see Neji finishing getting up the stairs from his match with Shino right behind him. She smiled seeing him walk up towards her. Hey, nice match and it looks like all that training paid off. Neji gave her a small smile, thanks to you. I wouldn't have been able to pull off a chitin without your help as you know. Tenton blushed from the compliment. Naruto of course saw how close the two seemed to be. They were standing very close to each other and they were perfectly relaxed. He had seen this enough times to know something was going on between them now. He had a feeling that Neji might have liked the bun-haired girl, hence all the messing with him. It was funny seeing Neji get all jealous. But now it seemed that Tenton might feel something as well. Well this was just too good an opportunity to mess with. Hey, you two were alone for a whole month together right? Naruto asked them. What is your point Hataki? Neji asked feeling a bit annoyed at the ruined moment. He always used Naruto's last name when he was annoyed with him. You two didn't get into anything, perverted with each other when no one was looking where you. He smirked at them as this caught the attentions of many around them. Especially when the two teens blushed, not because they had actually done anything, just that Naruto had said something might have happened. Oh are you two dating or something? Ino shot up, finally over her slight depression, anger at Shikamaru's loss. 
I think that's so cute. Damn it, why is everyone starting to hook up but me? Oh, looks like I missed out on some fun with just girls. Anko smirked at the two young Jennings. Maybe next times we should bring boys out for some joint training. I know Hanata wouldn't mind a month alone with Naruto here. I wouldn't mind that either, Naruto muttered more to himself and ignored Neji's hostile look at him for it. No, Guy shouted out almost in horror. Don't tell me that they have fallen to the perverted nature of the unyouthful while out of my sight. Sasuke grunted as he looked at the pair. If she did, she could do better than a branch member. What was that Uchiha? Neji narrowed his eyes and the implications to that. Sasuke only smirked back smugly. He had a feeling that Tenten might be spoken for now, oh well it was only a passing interest anyway. But that didn't mean he didn't want to miss out on messing with the Hyuga boy. It was one of the things he felt that Naruto had right, it was fun messing with Neji. Hold it, Tenten said seeing a fight nearly breaking out. She gently grabbed Neji by the hand to lead him away from a possible incident that could get him disqualified for fighting outside a match. Come on let's just sit and watch Lee. They didn't notice that they had kept their hands together until the match had started to the surprise of both of them. Dosu was not very happy, already his teammates had lost and it was only luck that he managed to get this far. Given the strength of the teams he had seen so far, already his two teammates were taken by Orokimaru for some reason. Apparently they still held some kind of usefulness or so he said. He didn't know what his master had in plan but with their failures, they had to do something to make up for it. Apparently another sound person had been chosen as well, one of the spies that had slipped into the village. Dosu put all those thoughts out of his mind as the green glad Jenin raced up to meet him. I am glad to fight you, please let us have a most youthful and exciting match. Lee said giving Dosu a thumbs up. Dosu only looked at the boy like he might be mentally handicapped. Then again he did remember how fast the kid was in the match against that Tsuna guy. Well no matter, all he had to do was get close enough to use his sound weapon and then the fight would all be over. The battle was started and Dosu channeled Chakra into the metallic sound weapon. He would need it ready to go at a moment notice. Lee wanted to get this fight started, he was all fired up and couldn't wait for the next fight. He charged his opponent and Dosu was only just able to get his weapon up in time. The sound waves came out and Lee's balance was taken away as he stumbled to take a knee. The world spun and he felt his stomach was about to empty itself. Dosu knew that this fight wouldn't take long, there was no way to counter the effect of his weapon when he landed a blow with it. It seemed the boy didn't have anything in his ears to counter the sound. Even if he had a physical blow would have done the same. He got closer as he prepared to crush the boy's skull with his gauntlet when something surprising happened. Lee's body shifted as he quickly gave a kick to Dosu's chin making him stagger back. Not to mention it had been painful and also gave him a slight ringing in his ears. He looked up to see Lee getting back onto his feet, although his legs were shaking a bit. He didn't understand it, he knew that the effect of his sound had worked there was no way the boy was faking, so how was he still standing let alone still fighting? What the hell, I thought that guy made weird sound things that you can't stand after or something, Eno said as Lee started to fight back. Sakura looked to Guy as an idea came to mind, Guy sensei, does Lee have anything blocking his hearing? Oh no nothing like that, Guy smiled proudly. You see Lee had to learn how to fight against his senses. This genin can make you feel as though the world is spinning from the sonic attacks to your inner ear. Now if sound travels through the body you can't defend against that with just plugging your ears. So for a whole month I made Lee fight while dizzy. Ah, uh, I know I'm going to regret asking this, Naruto started knowing the insane ways Guy liked to train. But how did you train him to fight while dizzy? Why it's simple, I spun him around and when he was dizzy enough I relentlessly attacked him. When he got better, I spun him some more and kept at it for a whole month. Guy said proud of his way of getting around the sound Jenin's attack. Now Lee's body fights almost automatically when in that state. Guy, you're really too much as times, Kakashi sighed as he palmed his face. Although Guy's training was to most insane, it was also highly effective. Dosu had never fought anyone that could fight like this. He tried to use the boy's body as a way to carry the sound, he threw a punch with his gauntlet weapon and it had hit. Lee had blocked the blow and Sadosu had sent the vibrations through the boy's hand. He knew it traveled up the arm and attacked the inner ear. But to Lee, after all the training he did, he could now fight through the disorientation. 
He hit the bandaged face of the other genin with his other hand sending the boy flying. Dosu had never been hit as hard as this boy. His blows were like iron, plus his speed was totally insane. A normal person shouldn't be able to move that fast. Lee's moves were so hard to see at times. He had been counting on his sonic abilities to get him through this match, he never once dreamed the boy could actually fight while disoriented. Lee came at him with such speed that Dosu barely had time to react, he put up his arms to defend himself. Lee shot out a fast and devastating kick, without the weights to hold him back the blow was amazing. He landed a perfect hit to the device that Dosu used and shattered it. Plus the bone in his arm along with it as the boy howled in pain. He gently gripped his arm and looked up in time to see a foot slamming into his face. Dosu was sent flying from the blow and when he landed he didn't get back up. Well I guess there's only one left, Naruto said looking to Sasuke who had that ever so confident look on his face. You up for this? Of course, Sasuke said to him. Just watch me, I didn't train my ass off for you to show me up. Naruto only grinned back, he couldn't wait to see what Sasuke did. Although looking across to see Gara entering the field did make him nervous. The kid was seriously messed up and he just radiated killing intent it seemed. He just hoped that whatever happened things didn't get too intense. It was the moment many had been waiting for, the final battle of the first rounds. So far it had been a very eventful tune and exam. Sasuke couldn't wait for his chance to show what he was capable of. Although from what he had seen of Gara in the previous fights a month ago, the boy wouldn't hesitate to kill him. Well that was fine with him, he made peace with death a long time ago. There were worse fates, and he had gone through a couple of those when he had been a child. A lot of weakness had been beaten out of him that night. Some people would have let that crush them, he had been forged into something harder. He had to be harder to survive this world. But lately the steel in him had been tempered again by the bonds he had formed with his team. At first he thought it a weakness, after all his older brother had told him to hate with all his heart. But maybe there was another way. After listening to Kakashi's story about another Uchiha, and the things he and his teammates had been through. He was starting to see things differently. Why did he have to go through life on the path his brother set for him? He didn't like the idea of playing to the tune his brother set for him. He was offered power by a madman, the mark still on his neck. But at what cost, he was gaining strength faster now since joining this team than all the years before. Naruto had challenged him the most, to push himself to greater heights. Yes they were teammates, and rivals but they were something more as well. He smirked as he walked down into the arena seeing Gara doing the same. He wouldn't let Naruto show him up with the fight he had, Sasuke had an even bigger challenge now as well. Any mistake here could kill him, so Sasuke would use everything he had to deal with this fight. Up in the stands everyone looked on. You think he'll be okay? Sakura asked a bit worried. He was confident in Sasuke's skills and abilities, but Gara just wasn't normal. Plus the boy gave her the creeps, the way the boy talked in that monotone gravely voice and his nearly dead eyes. She just hoped that whatever training he went through with Kakashi worked. Don't worry my dad would have whipped him into shape, Naruto said proudly. He knew firsthand that when his dad got serious about training it could get intense. Sakura nodded at his words taking some measure of comfort in him as they watched on. You could sense the tense atmosphere this was a fight many wanted to see. Sasuke, the famous last Uchiha, versus Gara of the desert, both boys many came to see. Although both young Sasuke held the pride of a nearly extinct clan, while many may not know of Gara personally, his mission record was amazing for his age. Sasuke looked across at the red-headed boy. The other boy's arms were folded like always. Gara always seemed like he was confident and bored at the same time. Although Sasuke did catch a small glint in the boy's green eyes, almost like Gara was considering noticing his presence. Sasuke waited for the proctor to start the match. As soon as they were given the go-ahead, Sasuke ran forward. He had to fight quickly against this boy and he was soon to find out just how right he was. Gara moved up a hand as he started out using his sand bullets. Small projectiles came out of the surrounding sand at his feet they flew out at dangerous speeds just like bullets. Sasuke had activated his Sharingan and saw the attacks coming. He pulled the sword out that he kept behind his lower back. With quick cuts he slashed through the sand as he kept moving forward. He knew that was just the opening move, and there could be anything coming next. 
The boy could control the sand to do anything, the only limit could only be the other boy's imagination in using it. He was right as large spikes came at him when he got too close. He managed to dodge them by jumping through the air, twisting his body to avoid others that came for him. He used his sword to cut through the sand spikes as he thought he was very close when he landed. Sasuke tried a slash with the sword but a wall of sand came nearly out of nowhere blocking it. He jumped back in time to avoid Gara's counter-attack. All of this was happening very quickly, but the battle was nowhere close to being over. Sasuke put his sword away as he saw an opportunity to try for a grand fireball. He quickly used the ninjutsu as a very large ball of fire went at Gara. He still stood there as his sand went to defend. But even with all that sand, it nearly broke through. The superheat of the fire started to cause some of the sand to turn to glass. That was a substance that Gara couldn't manipulate, even if it had once been his own sand. But most of the fire was used up against the sand, the little that made it through didn't make it past Gara's sand armor. But Gara wasn't worried, in fact he was starting to feel a bit of adrenaline kicking in. He was actually getting excited, this boy was turning out to not be a disappointment. His blood would feed his mother greatly. He knew what the others told him, what his father told him. Keep the match going and wait for the invasion signal. Then he was to unleash the true power within him. But he didn't care for plans or invasions. He was enjoying himself too much, this Uchiha would do well to prove his existence to the world. In fact he wasn't going to wait any longer, he had been waiting for an entire month. He hadn't done anything and the demon within had been whispering all this time for blood. He was in a stadium full of people so there would be much blood today. He grinned as he formed a full sphere of sand around him. Up in the stands with the Suna team they couldn't believe what Gara was doing. He only did that to buy time to call forth his tailed beast. It was also too soon for this to happen. The signal hadn't been given yet but they couldn't stop it now. Sasuke tried to get close to the sphere but large spikes would only shoot out to hit him. He tried another fire jutsu again but for some reason this sand was more difficult to turn to glass than before. This was obviously a purely defensive jutsu that the Suna boy was using. Obviously he needed a focused attack to get through, something like a fire jutsu was just too widespread. He only grinned as it was time to show the new trick he learned. Sasuke jumped up to one of the walls of the arena as he prepared the new jutsu. His team was watching as Naruto saw the hand seals and sharply looked at his father. Dad, did you really teach him that jutsu? Well it turns out that Sasuke can use lightning elements, plus I figured that it would be the one jutsu that I could teach him in one month that would get through that sand. Kakashi told him, plus only someone with a Sharingan can use that jutsu to its fullest potential. Anyone else would have a huge blind spot that would be fatal. What are you two talking about? Sakura asked him a little annoyed that she wasn't informed what was going on. Naruto only looked at her with a smile. Don't worry, you're about to see my dad's best jutsu in action. A sound like many birds at once suddenly filled the air. Sasuke's hand was glowing as what looked like he was holding lightning in his hands. He quickly ran down the wall, leaving a trail of destruction in the wake of the jutsu. He moved faster than he had ever moved before, all that speed training that Kakashi put him through. Speed was one of the essential parts of this jutsu, without speed you couldn't use it effectively. He ran too fast for Gara's defenses, plus with the Sharingan he could see attacks that would come at him. He dodged just enough to avoid being hit but nothing could stop him. He felt the Chidori pierce through the sand. It was an odd sensation, he had only used this one rocks up until now. His hand and arm felt slightly tingly from the lightning, but moving through the sand. It was like piercing water with your hand. Then he felt it connect with something, something not as hard. He ended the jutsu before he lost too much chakra and he could have sworn that he felt something wet against his hand. He heard a scream from behind the sand a moment later, and it wasn't ending. He quickly jumped back as his opponent wasn't dead, which meant he was too exposed in that position for a counter-attack. The boy was still screaming when the sand fell away and he could see that there was a wound on his arm. Apparently he was screaming something about blood, but he didn't care. He prepared himself for the next attack, and given that his opponent seemed more unhinged than normal so there was no telling what was going to happen next. But if he didn't do anything soon, Sasuke planned to attack anyway. In the stands looking over the fight, stood a certain white-haired genin of the leaf. 
At least that's what many would have thought seeing Kabuto, if he was in his normal clothing. At the moment he was disguised as an Anbu black op. The white mask and cloak were easy enough to take off an Anbu he had taken out earlier. Kabuto now saw that the time was right. For some reason Gara had tried to call out his demon earlier than planned. Well the boy looked close to blowing any restraints he kept on his power, so he might as well get the real party started. Their people should be in place in and outside the village by now anyway. Those that infiltrated the stadium were here already that he could see. It was time for the Genjutsu, and to signal the attack in the end of the Leaf Village. Soon after that, small white feathers seemed to fall over the stadium from out of nowhere. Everyone looked up wondering where such things had come from. Then people started to feel tired, like weights were attached to every part of their bodies. Everything was getting heavy and they couldn't keep their eyes opened. Oh man I feel like taking a nap, Naruto yawned out. Did his fight take this much out of him already? Maybe if he just closed his eyes for a bit that seemed okay to him. Kakashi sensei, Sakura muttered as she felt the effects taking hold. She shook her head trying to get her mind focused. She slammed her hands together into a seal. Kai. She dispelled the genjutsu that had been forming on her. Her mind clearing up she looked around to see all the jonin still up but so far everyone else had fallen asleep. What's going on? Sakura get everyone who is genin and above up. Guy and I will cover you. Kakashi said in a calm and serious tone. Sakura was going to ask, cover her from what, when she saw that several of the people in the stands close by were disguised ninja. They jumped out of the civilian clothing and they wore grey clothing. She noticed that they all wore the symbol of a sound note, making them sound ninja. Well what are you waiting for? Anko said to her while looking at the enemy with a grin on her face. Things are about to get bloody so get your friends up. Sakura nodded as she quickly went to work as battles started all over the place. Among the two cages, things weren't much different as the Kazekage and his bodyguards went to attack the Hokage and his defenders. Sarutobi saw the Kazekage make his move, in his younger days he would have been able to move fast enough to get out of the way. So now the Kazekage was holding a kunai to his throat. So I see you finally sprung your trap, Sarutobi sighed as looked out at the battle starting. I figured that it would be on this day that you would attack. The Kazekage stiffened a bit but he recovered. Oh so you knew about this after all. I was worried but I thought we covered all possible leaks. I guess we missed one. Yes you did, the Hockage stated calmly as though nothing was going on at the moment. So where is my old student? Why, right here sensei. Orokimaru's voice said from behind the white mask of the Kazekage. He grinned as he saw the shocked expression on his old teacher's face. I have to admit that the fool had entertained the plan for a bit, but he didn't have the backbone to go far enough. So I had to take matters into my own hand. When Suna realizes things they will turn against you. Oh I know, I left the body of their Kazekage in a place that won't be found in time. Plus when everything is over Kanoa will have fallen and Suna will be too hurt to come after me for some time. Plus I'm sure that any survivors of Kanoa will want blood for the destruction of the village. And they will hate, I promise you on that one, Orokimaru said gleefully. I have orders to kill all the women and children and the civilians. To burn this village to the ground when your forces are in retreat, to leave nothing that can be rebuilt. But since you knew about this attack I suppose you already have plans in motion. The Hokage smiled, yes and it's too late for you to do anything about it. Already my Anbu have been silently taking out sooner and sound teams that you thought you had infiltrated. Yes but what of outside the village? Orokimaru grinned. I know the defenses of this village well, how else could I have gotten in so easily? I've spent time looking and I was disappointed to find that you haven't changed the security of the village totally when I left. But anyway, we should be seeing one of my surprises right now. Off in the distance there was a rumbling sound, from their viewpoint they could both see a large snake attacking one of the grand walls that defended the village. The ninja that were there tired to fight it off, but a snake that size made its scales as thick as armor. You're not the only one with surprises you know, the Hokage said to him. You're not my only student that has been staying here. Orokimaru's eyes widened as giant toads started to appear. I should have guessed that old pervert was here, well this certainly makes things interesting. Did you get all of the infiltrators, will he be able to handle my summons? Orokimaru said. I admit, I'm not as confident in my total victory. But I will settle for bringing this village to its knees.
in such a weakened state, and with no allies there are many that will take advantage of it. I think I've had enough of your talking, Sarutobi said as with quick reflexes even for a man of his age he managed to get out of the hold. He had been surprised before, but he had been planning on getting out of Orokimaru's hands as soon as he could. The talking was just a way to force his focus slightly off him, just enough to get out. He threw his robes aside as the black and grey battle armour that had been under it was now shown. Orokimaru only chuckled as he threw away the white robes to reveal his true appearance. It seems that you also dressed for the occasion, Orokimaru told him. But I don't want anyone to interfere in this. This is an old score between you and I, so I want to ensure that. He raised a hand and out of nowhere four other ninja, in sound clothing appeared on the rooftop. They quickly went to four sides as they started with hand seals. The Anbu had managed to take care of the first group of sound defenders, they were now trying to reach their hockage. But before they could get too close a barrier was created. The Anbu were about to go for the four ninja that created the barrier but they enclosed themselves in a secondary one. The lead Anbu looked around and he couldn't see any way inside. It seemed to be totally enclosed. Leaning down he placed a hand onto the roof. He stayed like that for a minute before he pulled his hand away. Senpai. One of the other Anbu asked him. It's no good, it covers the entire bottom as well, we can't get in. He said disgruntled. Elsewhere with Hyashi and his family, he had managed to keep awake from the Genjustu. Hanabi was still asleep but he was unable to wake her as he was busy with the enemy. He was surprised to see that Hanata managed to keep awake as well. On the other hand, given who her sensei was maybe he shouldn't be surprised. She was helping him to protect Hanabi so he didn't have to worry about anyone slipping past him. His eldest was doing very well to help out, although her style wasn't as refined and advanced as Neji, she was doing well. Then a few ninja got between him and his daughters, for a moment he panicked on the inside. He tried to move to their side but was prevented. He noticed more was starting to gang up on Hanata as she was covering her younger sister. Although her skill had improved she wasn't good enough to handle that many opponents. He was going to try a desperate move to get to them, it would leave him with all types of openings that he knew their enemies would exploit. But before he tried to do anything he noticed that Hanata was making hand seals. He hadn't known her to use ninjutsu before, most Hyuga only knew basic ones as they focused more on the gentle first. When she was finished a mist started to form around her and the others. It looked like the same technique that the mist ninja has used earlier. He was so caught by the action that he nearly missed a sound ninja using a kunai to try and slash at his throat. Hyashi managed to dodge it and counter, striking the man several dozens of times in a second. The man crumpled to the floor, his chakra totally shut off. It was then that he could hear the confusion of the sound ninja inside of the mist. They called out to one another but they soon were cut off by their own cries of pain. Hanata was fighting them all now, while they were blind she could see them. Even if the mist was blinding her, thanks to her bloodline she could see through any type of mist. He battled on as he kept an eye on his eldest daughter. He would have to ask when she learned this. For Hanata she was trying to focus on protecting her sister, and not the fear that was gripping her belly. She had never been in such a violent environment. Sure she had seen battle but this was something on another level entirely. There was a mass of confusion as there were yells, cries, and sounds of battle all around her. So she focused on just protecting Hanabi and pushed the fear down. She had used the mist jutsu only in training before. When she had trained with Sakura with their water affinity, she had used the scrolls that Sakura had gotten from Kakashi. What she hadn't known was that this was one of the moves he had copied from his battle with Zabuza. Hanata used the blindness of her opponents to her advantage. While they stumbled around she easily slipped in among them and attacked. They couldn't dodge her attacks at this range with no sight, if they could see she would have been overwhelmed. She was glad that she took the time to use this move and that there was enough moisture in the air to cover a small area. She didn't have the reserves or enough water to cover an area like say the stadium like a Jonan could. But this was enough for her. So she focused on the enemy, pushing everything else away. Her body reacted almost as if on instinct, when one opponent fell she went to another, then another and another. It wasn't until she noticed that all her opponents were now down on the ground that she let herself calm and focus outward. Slowly the mist unfolded and she looked to see that Hanabi was safe. She looked to see that her father had also finished with his own enemies and he was looking at her. 
She wasn't sure, but was he looking at her with pride? Her uncle broke the moment as he appeared among them. I'm sorry for being late, it took time to make my way here. Hyashi nodded knowing full well how hard it had to be. He looked around the stadium and saw that Neji was up by this point. He saw that pink-haired friend of Naruto's waking up the Genins. It looks like Neji is up with his team, he should be in good hands. Please take Hanabi to be safe with the others and ensure that the children of the village are protected. Hyashi saw his younger twin hesitate if only for a second. Hyashi knew full well what his brother was thinking. Hanata go see to Neji, I'm sure your sensei has need for you to be with your team. Hanata was surprised but she bowed slightly with her head before leaving. Don't worry brother, by what I saw, your son had grown very strong. His twin paused if only to give a small smile before picking up Hanabi. Yes he has, but as a father I can't help but still worry. Hiyashi could only nod in agreement. Back with the others, Naruto was just finally waking up. He didn't know what was going on at first, the last thing he remembered was something about feathers. Now he was looking up at a ceiling with Sakura looking down at him. Naruto, wake up. Sakura shook him knowing how groggy he got when he first wakes up. Ha. Huh. WH what's going on? Naruto shook his head and slowly got up. He looked around to see nothing but chaos. There were people fighting all over the place and he saw all his friends looking slightly overwhelmed by everything as well. What the hell? Were being attacked by the sound and sand ninja, Sakura told him. They seem to have put the people in the village to attack us. Ha. Huh. Sand, but aren't our village's friends? Kiba asked knowing at least that much. Then again he couldn't really deny what he was seeing at the moment. He could see at least a few people with the Suna symbols on them. He looked down to see that the full Suna team was now in the arena and Sasuke was all alone. Oh crap, are they going to gang up on him? Everyone that heard it looked to see where Kiba was pointing. Oh hell no, Naruto said as he looked to Sakura. She nodded her head as the two of them went off to join their teammate. They avoided any ninja on the way they're only focusing on joining their friend. Kakashi saw this but he knew that it might take all of Team 7 to deal with just Gara. He was a bit busy himself just dealing with the forces with the other Jonans at the moment. He saw Guy was with his students as they were moving around clockwise. It looked like he was going to take the clear out the stadium. Kuranai and Asuma were fighting near him and Anko was somewhere behind them helping to ensure no one snuck up on their backs. He looked to Asuma and Kuranai. I think my team could use some help with the blonde and the puppet user. Kuranai nodded her head looking to Kiba. Kiba, you and Akamaru. Go. The two didn't need to be told twice as they rushed off to help them. Asuma looked to Ino and Choji, the two knew what they were being asked as they went off to join Kiba. Well I think we need to get things moving, Anko said as she looked to everyone there. The fighting had lessened enough that she could relax a bit. Everyone else get scrolls telling them what to do. She saw they nodded. Well let's get going. I got the kids to help protect, apparently so I need to make my way there. I'll cover you with Shino and Hanata when she gets here. Kuranai said seeing her young female student running towards them. She would reach them in a few more seconds, so she would grab her on the way out and explain along the way. I have to help with the streets, so Shikamaru you're coming with me. Asuma said to the Nara boy, who did not look very happy about it. Anko stopped before leaving facing away from Kakashi and Guy as they had just started another round of attacks against a new wave of enemy. Kakashi, you better not get hurt or I will be pissed. Kakashi only chuckled before backhanding an attacking ninja. I know, that's why I won't. Anko only smirked before she left with the others. In the arena things were a bit more different, Gara was screaming incoherently with one bloody hand on his face. Temari was trying to calm him down but it wasn't working. Gara's injury plus his bloodlust was too much at the moment. Kankuro looked nervously behind him as his newly rebuilt puppet was already out. It had taken him the entire month but he got it working just in time. Sasuke already had his sword out but he wasn't going to make a move, not just yet. There were three of them and only one of him so whoever he attacked, two could attack him in return. Although given how the blonde woman was trying to get Gara under control he could in theory attack the makeup man. But that was only in theory. He suddenly heard some new footfalls behind him. He didn't turn his head as if he took his eyes off he knew that guy with the puppet would attack as soon as he did. But then he smirked as he knew those sounds, well at least two of them. 
he wasn't surprised to see Naruto come up beside him and Sakura on the other side. Both of them had their weapons drawn and were ready for a fight. What took you so long? Sasuke said with a smirk. Ah shut up, we could just leave you alone with them you know. Naruto said slightly annoyed. Fine by me, not like I actually needed any help. Sasuke told Naruto. It is only three of them. Sakura sighed, Anko-sensei was right, all men are just boys. She muttered to herself. Kiba with Ino and Choji came by right behind them at that moment. With that Kankuro looked a bit more nervous, the odds were now two to one, well numerically at least. But he was still worried about Gara behind them, if he let loose his full power numbers wouldn't matter. He would attack friend or foe if the worst came. He just hoped that Temari could convince Gara to go because right now things were not looking good. That will be it for this video if you want more comment down below, like, subscribe. And see you guys later.